working at a high load is not a problem. It's yeah. how you get there is the problem. At Lattice Training, we get asked about injury prevention all the time. So much so that recently someone suggested we should do a training plan for someone that gets injured a lot. To tackle this subject, I thought it was important we brought in a physiotherapist and one that specializes in rock climbing. In this video, I sit down with Andy, or as some of you might know him, Process Physio on Instagram. I asked Andy to prepare his top five tips for injury prevention. I'm also going to give my top five tips. So I'd say my first point is to ramp up slowly, and I think this is particularly important for anyone that's starting some structured training for the first time. The tendency we often have is to jump in and just do it all straight away because often in those first few weeks we're really excited motivation is really high and we kind of just want to experiment with everything and it's really easy to do way too much and the best thing you can do is to have a really gradual ramp up and i'd say those first one or two weeks of training should actually not feel much different to what you've been doing in the weeks or months prior to that start of a training plan or start of structured training what people tend to want to do is to work really hard. They think that's where success lies. And the job of a coach uh, in particular is to try and get you to find your minimal effective dose. Mm. Where's the level for you where you can do the least amount possible to get the biggest gains possible? And it's finding that balance. Working at a high load is not a problem. Uh, it's yeah. how you get there. Mm -hmm. is the problem and if you go too fast then you increase your injury risk if you um, like in the run-up to um, trips and such like suddenly do a high peak and then you rest afterwards and then you have another high peak so peaks and troughs are also really dangerous it's about just building up nice and gently yeah, and making sure you arrive at your destination safely one of the areas that I do discuss a lot with patients, and obviously if I'm seeing them, then it means that something has happened and they've already had an injury. So we tend to look at what has happened, what can we learn from this to try and not let it happen again. And it's about the principle of, of auto-regulation, which is built in within coaching plans, but there has to be some flexibility within that. If you're down for a high-level power-based session, but you've had a heck of a couple of weeks at work, um, you're in the, the hardest week of your training and such like, and it's all coincided at the wrong time, and you're really not feeling it, then you need to listen to that. There's nothing to be gained by pushing. You're far better to slightly undertrain than slightly overtrain, because if you keep slightly overtraining, you will end up with an injury. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd absolutely second the idea of slightly under-training um, just because it's way better to be conservative and maybe miss out on a tiny bit of that adaptation you could have had rather than push it a little bit too far, have an injury, and ultimately that's going to be the biggest blocker in terms of your progress within the sport is just picking up injuries time and time again and not really letting yourself recover. My next point is relatively similar to the auto-regulation in the sense that you're listening to your body and I guess auto-regulation is kind of listening to levels of fatigue and energy and mine would get be to look out for warning signs and so I think most climbers or a lot of climbers have these niggles around their shoulder or finger. Maybe you're picking up a bit of inflammation. Um, and actually it's really easy to ignore that and just push through. But actually that's the time at which you should say, what have I been doing and why am I picking up these kind of niggles? Why do I feel like I've got some inflammation? and take a step back. So again, just listening to your body, looking for those warning signs and don't just push through. Maybe try to manage the training you're doing if that's reducing the, the training volume or reducing the training intensity. And if it's been around for a long time, and I think a lot of people will just start to live with these things, then seek out a physio, seek out a specialist which can actually just say, uh, ask the why you have those pain or you have this pain and then take a step back and evaluate it with a professional, which is going to be able to help give you some guidance. Climbers are not great. There, there seems to be an historic sort of philosophy of the more injuries you've got, the greater the kudos, um, as opposed to, yeah, you know, being injury free, improving your climbing, your know, consistency, that, that's what, exactly what we're after. So to hear that from the, the coaching point of view, again, obviously I see it from the other side when things have, have kind of actually already happened. and. It is hard, it is difficult. Um, these signs, 
tend to be whispers rather than a shout. It is that little niggle at the base of your finger. It is that, oh, just a little bit of a, a pain at the front of the shoulder, that type of thing. They're not huge standout moments where you go, uh-oh, I think I've got a niggle coming up. So you do have to be really tuned in and do listen to those. Um, again, if, you know, if they're ignored, then yeah, disaster awaits, essentially. One thing I'm quite keen on as well is people actually recovering between climbing sessions, not just resting between climbing sessions. Um, there's a great deal of difference between just going home and sitting on the sofa and letting your body do its thing, or the making sure that you've actually taken some positive steps to speed that recovery process up. Now, again, that things sleep, nutrition, hydration, and such like, but we know that systemic exercise between climbing sessions or training sessions can be really beneficial. That's just going for a walk, going for an easy bike ride. These are all different for different people. Some people will be able to go and have a run, and that will be recovery for them. Other people, it'll be a walk if they're a boulderer that's not used to cardio. Um, but getting some kind of systemic exercise into your body to help it recover. It's not just as simple as rest between sessions. So stretching is definitely one as well. If you've done two hours of hard training, then what does that need to look like for you to recover from that? Is that gonna be a full day? It might be for some people. Is it gonna be two days? It might be for some people. The important thing is, is that when you step back into the gym, you feel like you're ready to give that eight out of 10 effort again. You kind of mentioned it there with the active recovery looks different for everyone. Mm. And for example, going for a run versus going for a walk might represent the same internal kind of training load for someone. And I think there's value in, particularly if you want to be a high level rock climber, being a general athlete before you become a specialized athlete. So having that general cardiovascular fitness is going to improve how you tolerate stress and how you recover from your training. So there is an argument to say that actually just having a little bit of that cross training effect and being generally fit so that you can recover better is going to help mitigate that injury risk in the long term. So my next point is stress is stress. It doesn't really matter what it looks like or what form it comes in. It will definitely get in the way of your recovery. And as coaches, we'll try and plan this in advance. So this could be starting a new job, moving house, having a child, anything which is a really busy time in your life. Uh, if we can plan that in, in advance, I will try and make sure that we're reducing the amount of training going on in that period, simply because you're not going to be able to tolerate as much training load. You're not going to be recovering as well. We really want to consider that. But if you're self-coached or even if you are coached, it's some of these things just crop up when you don't even know they're going to happen. And it's really important to be compassionate of yourself and say, actually, I, I really just need to pull back on all the other things to try and manage the, the kind of holistic stress that's going on in your life. And the easiest thing to change for a lot of people is just do a little bit less training because often these things going on aren't things that you can really influence that easily. Super easy to say and super hard, particularly for climbers to do, but I really hope that the message is getting out there now. And I, I love that word, you know, be compassionate with yourself, just be kind to yourself in these times. I often see people a bit mystified as to as to how they've they've got injured the body doesn't differentiate between physical stress emotional stress if you think of the the names that we give to our emotions they're their physical names we do feel them they have an impact on the body and positive stress is the same as a negative stress um, and it's about getting somebody in that time to acknowledge that you know you're not going to be pbing at, at this moment it's absolutely fine to take a small amount of time to step back, maybe just climb rather than train, you know, really enjoy yourself. You know, it doesn't, you know, put into, you know, reap the rewards of some of those gains, hopefully you've made, and then get back on the training horse, you know, when the time's right. Mm. But yeah, you can't fight it. You've got to roll with it sometimes. You can adjust what you can in life to fit your training in, but sometimes it's just, you've got to go with it. I like what you said about just climb, don't train. Cause actually I've done that myself in periods of like high stress. Cause actually I think the climbing element is really cathartic. It's like yeah. actually a really nice, you know, actually I will be stressed and I will go climbing because of it. Because yes. I need a little bit of time just to like, yeah. you know. And it's one of the reasons why most of us get so into climbing is that it's an absorbing activity. Yeah. You engage with it. Your mind isn't on those stressful factors and yeah. And, but it can sometimes people lose that and it becomes all about the training and you forget what you're training for yeah. so you can yeah. enjoy the climbing. So there's 
more and more support both in literature and anecdotally now about getting strong for climbing uh, and that great phrase you can't go wrong getting strong it's slightly misunderstood a lot of the time in that people think if they get stronger they will instantly bump up two grades in their climbing climbing is a massively technical sport what we actually do when we get stronger is build capacity to be able to train more and learn how to apply that strength that we've gained but from a physiotherapy point of view we're also looking at the body being generally more robust you can do more moves you can pull or, or get into different positions and sustained positions a little bit longer and that type of thing and therefore potentially have a bit more success that's where the gains actually come from it'd be nice if it was a straight transfer from i've upped my bench press by 20 kilos and suddenly i'm i'm there uh, climbing two grades harder um, but it's a long-term background um, activity from my point of view regarding injury prevention it's something that should be continuing throughout the year um, and just be an ongoing process of getting yourself as robust as you possibly can be I don't think I can add much more to that I mean my next point is is strength training for injury prevention it's exactly the same point um, and I think it's a t there's a tendency within climbers to only train for something that will reward with performance. Mm. And so we do our pull-ups or our lock-offs and stuff, and we try to mimic the climbing movements we're doing. But look at your strength training from a really more generous approach, right? Like training the hips and these, um, building the capacity in areas which maybe climbing doesn't stress quite as acutely as like, you know, just hanging on a fingerboard or doing pull-ups. Um, yeah get strong but be a little bit more general in that approach and I think that's going to pay off with the injury prevention. Yeah, for sure. So my final point is to beware of your breakthrough week and I think this happens to most climbers at some point where you'll have a week or two where you just feel like you've made really good gains. Maybe you're seeing actual PBs in some of your training metrics or sunny climbing just feels really easy and you feel really effortless and you just feel like you've leveled up. And for whatever reason this happened, that it's really easy to just ride that wave, ride the momentum of feeling really good in your climbing. And what tends to happen is one, two weeks later, you've got an injury, a finger injury or a shoulder injury, something's gone wrong and it's just all toppled down. And this is very anecdotal, but we kind of see this again and again with people that we've coached and now we're a little bit more hesitant and being like trying to pull people back from just ramping up really quickly because what tends to happen you're feeling really good you start projecting more because that's really rewarding because you're climbing harder things or you start bumping up the weights you're lifting because you can now do it and it feels easy and what happens is this external training load just goes up takes a huge step up and it happens within a week or two weeks and this is kind of something we covered earlier, is that training load has just gone up huge. Your, in, your intrinsic training load feels low, but the external training load has gone up loads. And ultimately, that's the same risk factors we've discussed, and that can end in injury. So my advice is, if you start feeling really good and everything's just feeling effortless, actually put on the brakes a little bit and try and, try and slow down that, that feeling of progress so that you're not ramping up really quickly. Although Josh is saying that's anecdotal, my experience is, is also the same. Uh, definitely you get people, the way I explain it to them is that you're, if you're operating at a level you've never operated at before, your body is undergoing new stresses and strains at a level it has never undergone before. And actually, on the one hand, you kind of high five and go, yeah, fantastic. And on the other, you're sort of like going, okay, and now we just need to consolidate mm -hmm. and sit here for a while and allow your body to develop before we take the next step forward. A really hard message to give, but I think definitely the right one for long-term development. Mm. So I feel that all training should be flexible. You do get training plans but there is flexibility built in within them you will have a training week and you will have uh, a hard session power based session perhaps and maybe an endurance based session and if you turn up to train and decide that on that day you're not feeling it for that power based session for argument's sake if you don't have a fallback plan if you don't have a plan b people tend to just bulldoze on and carry on and because that's the plan and that's what they have to do. And if they don't do that session, then it's a failure. Uh, you know, they're not working towards their goal. Whereas if you've got a plan B that if I'm not feeling it, 
I can drop back to that. I know it's still a positive towards the goal I'm working towards. I know it's still training. I'm doing what I should be doing. And maybe I can fit that power session in later in the week. And it's just having that little bit of flexibility with yourself can really stop you well, for starters from getting injured, but also keep your training sessions quality because that power session is not going to be a good power session if you're not really feeling it. From coaching climbers, I probably have a few little, like go-to areas for having a plan B yeah. when it comes to a session. I'd say, and it depends on the scenario and it depends, it depends on that self-auto-regulation uh, kind of feeling what you've got to give to that session when you turn up. If you feel kind of tired, but you can sustain the intention that sets a strength power session but you're feeling a bit tired i would always say just cut the session in half it's a really easy change to do you can still have the intention you're still trying to develop strength and power cut the session in half just do less set less sets you have less volume you're going to recover faster so that's one really easy option the other option is if you turn up to the session and you just can't sustain that right intensity and you said like maybe you swap the strength and power for an endurance session so that would be to change the intention of the session altogether mm -hmm. because if you're not able to do strength and power to a high quality or sometimes if it's power endurance you're not able to reach that kind of proximity to failure ultimately that session is not going to yield the results you want from it so you're better off just doing something different or calling it for a social session and recovering so that two three days down the line you get back into gym and you can go back in with the right intention and, and start to train properly yeah cool it's just about keeping training quality mm. isn't it in whatever way that looks like on that day as you might have seen with both Andy's and my points, they're really not that far apart from each other and quite synonymous in many ways. And these tips are not groundbreaking anyway, they're very much covering the basics. So while these are important for someone that wants to form a training plan or a routine and are really careful about avoiding injury, they're also going to go into any training plan and really be the foundation to start from. I want to say thanks again for Andy for coming in for this video. It was really a pleasure working with him. If you want to reach out to Andy, I'll leave a link to his socials below and also his website. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.